Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is an alternative to UPS and FedEx with my friend Mark Lavelle. Mark is the CEO of a company called Margo. Margo is a first-of-its-kind parcel delivery platform purpose-built for branded direct-to-consumer delivery. So we all know UPS and FedEx, great companies, but a lot of companies are looking for an alternative. Mark and Margo are exactly what you're looking for. So check out my interview with Mark Lavelle. He's a very interesting guy, and what they're doing at Margo is game-changing. So check it out. But... Before we get to the interview, I want to tell you about my friends over at Port X Logistics. Port X Logistics is an asset-based transportation company, and they specialize in containerized freight. So if you're having trouble moving your cargo out of the port, very common problem, then reach out to my friends over at Port X Logistics, and their website is portxlogistics.com. They're experienced, and they offer service at every single port, and every single rail ramp in the United States and Canada. They have an approach that is guided by their four pillars, which is culture, service, tech, and trucks. Again, check them out over at portxlogistics.com. So how's it going, Mark? Great, Joe. Great to be here today. I'm glad you're here. So tell us a little bit about you. Well, better yet, introduce yourself and your company, where you're calling from today. Yes, I'm uh, calling from beautiful Lake Tahoe in Nevada. I am the CEO of a company called Margo. We're a fairly new company that provides expedited logistics and parcel shipping for the top uh, brands shipping direct to consumers in the United States. Very nice. Now, I know you have an interesting spelling for Margo. How do you spell Margo? M-A-E-R-G-O dot com. Margo.com. Yep. So all of us want to say something other than that. (laughs) Margo, Margo, you know. (laughs) So one more time, what does Margo do? So we are an asset light parcel delivery network. So we orchestrate from pickup at a distribution center all the way to the final mile, you know, delivery address for basically we work in the one to 20 pound segment of the industry. So we're working with fashion and apparel brands, specialty items, you know, the, the direct to consumer brands that are competing against Amazon for e-commerce. And we provide this in a two to three day national network that allows them to really meet consumer expectations for what, uh, for what shipping and, and delivery uh, means today. And I, and that I think we'll get into uh, through the course of our conversation. Yeah. And by the way, we've talked on my podcast in the past about UPS and FedEx and Nothing against them. I think everybody uses them. I don't think anyone has a problem with that. But what for a long time, especially during COVID, they just took, they grew like a weed and they had to spend a lot of money to grow like a weed. And I would say they had tremendous capacity. And I think in recent years, they're like everybody else. They're trying to figure out how do we focus on what's profitable for us? And if you are not a profitable business for them for whatever reason, they will let you know with the price. They aren't going to they aren't going to send you an email and say, "Joe, we're going to give you a very high go away price." <laughs> They're just going to yes. give me the go away price. And I think for a long time you would go, "What choice do I have? It's UPS or FedEx. If they don't want your business, they might ch- and and they have to charge more for it. All of us are the same." And but now they're starting to be alternatives like your company. It's classic disruption, Joe. Maybe you asked about my background. I'll kind of talk about that by way of answering your question about FedEx and UPS. They're two great companies, right? But this is what the disruption cycle looks like. If you rewind 23 years, I'm getting a little older. I was in the payments industry when e-commerce started. And there used to be just a couple of options, Visa and MasterCard and Amex, and somewhere in there was Discover, but it was really Visa and MasterCard. It was the only way you can pay for your items. And we started a company that became the buy now, pay later industry, is now part of PayPal, that allowed people to buy without credit cards. And in the beginning, people were like, well, how are you going to compete with, with Visa and MasterCard? They own the market. And if you look today, they still are very successful companies. They own a lot of the market, but there's 
20 to 30% of payments happen today off the Visa and MasterCard network or through other other devices that, that flow into that network. So I saw that disruption happen in payments through the company called Bill Me Later and then spent time with PayPal. And at PayPal and eBay, I saw the challenge that merchants had with just selling to consumers. So the whole technology involved with e-commerce was developing during the time. And I got hold of a company called Magento, Magento, which eBay owned, spun that out into an independent company. We were helping small, medium, and large merchants be able to you know, interact with customers globally through websites and uh, order management systems and the like. And that's where I started to see the problems that you talked about with FedEx and UPS, where you could do everything right with marketing and e-commerce and payments and shipping was a real challenge. It was costing more and more every year. The choices were very limited. And it's because what you said, FedEx and UPS have seen this growth in this industry and started to cherry pick what they wanted to do. And worse, they started to price expedited shipping sort of out of out of the market for anybody other than Amazon, who, is, as we know, created their own network to be able to do this. So that's why I got into this. That's what Margo is looking to do is, is help uh, brands that aren't Amazon compete without, you know, having to use the very expensive FedEx and UPS systems. Yep. And somebody said it on my podcast the other day, and I don't have this, this stat myself, but when I mentioned that I'm from automotive and that in automotive, like the cost of logistics is like five or 10%, usually 5% of revenue. So you look and say, so I remember somebody one time said something like, you have to come and explain why you air freighted something to China. And I was like, no, I don't. I'm not going to logistics meetings. Like I'll never go to logistics. I remember famous last words. I'll said, I never will attend a logistics meeting. I sent <laughs> one of my guys. I was like, I'm never going to go. But when you switch over to e-commerce, I believe that the cost of logistics is 20% of that sale. It, it's probably higher when you put in, you know, you, when you look at it end to end and it's and it's growing, right? It's getting more more expensive. And the options that brands have, if you're not going to use the FedEx or UPS system, you try to zone skip, you try to do some of these things, you start to duplicate or triplicate your inventory. You know, then the complexity of warehousing uh, order, you know, uh, inventory uh, management goes exponential on you. And, um, and, and those are, those are very, very difficult costs for the smaller uh, brands to manage. So trying to meet customer expectations of fast and transparent shipping while you're, you know, growing a brand and trying to manage inventory is a huge challenge. And that's what we've gotten into this for. And uh, we've, we've done a consumer study recently. I'd love to talk about the kind of illuminates what the what the real challenge is on the consumer expectation side for brands today. Yep. Yep. Before we get into that, well, first off, I've heard so many people who are really successful. I think Mark, is it Thiel? Peter Thiel? Peter Thiel, yeah. Elon Musk, all these guys were all at PayPal. Did you bump into any of these famous guys? No, but I've I've bumped into them along the way, but they were they were gone before I arrived. We sold our company to to PayPal in two thousand and eight and they were well on to you know missions to Mars and <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Well very nice, very nice. So we were in, in the automotive. So Mark, uh, tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give it uh, you started to give it the tail end of your career. Tell us where you started. I grew up in um Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I went to school at Miami of Ohio, in Oxford, Ohio. Oh, nice. Yeah. My wife and I met there and we, um, we had, we had four beautiful daughters that are in their twenties today. And, um, we moved out to California when we sold, uh, to, to eBay and, uh, recently moved to Austin. So I've had a, a career in payments and in the internet and e-commerce. And now I'm in the, uh, logistics industry for the purpose of really, I think, completing the what is the hardest part now for for brands to succeed in, which is the uh, the logistics uh, delivery piece? So you saw this big opportunity in the market, and say it one more time where you saw that opportunity as that hole in the market, so to speak. There was, I mean, uh, there's 22 billion parcels shipped in the U.S. Uh, Damn. annual, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's uh, it's a huge market. I like huge markets. It's a complex market, and they're very very challenging problems to solve. 
And so those three things kind of generally make for, you talked about venture capital, like venture capital has noticed this, private equity has noticed this, that it's a big market that is very fragmented other than the the top of the, the, the chain with, with FedEx and UPS. And so there's, there's a lot of opportunities for technology to solve some of these problems. And I think you're seeing that cycle of investment happen. And I think it'll be ultimately over the next five, 10 years, a very good thing for the, uh, for the, for the brands in the industry trying to be more cost effective, but more importantly, more responsive to the consumer. Yeah. And we also know this is, and this has happened across the supply chain. Shippers demanded more of the brands. And that means us, the logistics providers all have to step up. And we had DHL come in for a minute and they're still here. Actually, I'm talking to them later today. They're still here, but they they had this, they were going to be that third competitor against UPS and FedEx. Now I think they're only international to and from the United States. And they also have kind of a sortation model that they use. But from what I have understood, it's really expensive to kind of get, build what UPS and FedEx have. So how did you guys go about doing that? It's very expensive to do it from the way they did it, which is massive hub and spoke network, right? With giant sortation centers, at, you know, in Memphis and, and elsewhere, we're flying airplanes in, sorting, flying airplanes out, keeping trucks moving. What we discovered is if you look over the past 20 years, there actually has been massive investment in regional regional carriers that can get the final mile delivery to the customer. There is a lot of sophistication in the middle mile. I think one big unlock that we've done is, you know, FedEx and UPS has a couple thousand planes. The the national airlines have, have t- tens of thousands, right, of flights that they're doing daily to all of these locations that parcels are going back and forth in. So Joe, why can you and I get on, a, on an airplane in LA and be in New York in five hours and home in another hour or two, but it takes parcels, you know, six, seven days to, to <laughs> right. travel. So the reason is there's a lot of spare capacity in those, those airlines, uh, in the bellies of those airlines, because we've all been trained to put our luggage above our heads, right, in the bins. And so we're utilizing that spare capacity, which is a, first of all, it's, it's a more carbon friendly way to do it. If you're going to fly the plane, you might as well fly it full. So we're providing a revenue stream and uh, using that spare capacity. Second important part is you can get the package closer to its final mile destination directly. So if you wanted to send something from Salt Lake to Tampa, why not take a take it on a flight from Salt Lake to Tampa? Why put it on a on a on a plane that goes to Memphis and then on a truck that goes to an, to Georgia and then in a sortation that goes to the final mile. So what's available today to us with technology is to tap into all of these existing networks that are crisscrossing the country, crisscrossing these addresses, and piecing that together into a a service that we give our brands, which is a two to three day national network for parcel delivery. And it works extremely well. And from their perspective, you, you said knit together, but from their perspective, it's just seamless. You guys are the shipper. I mean, you're there, you're responsible for that shipment. And I'm assuming you have technology that, that manages all this. We have technologies that manages all of it. And you said it, it's, it's not that the VPs of logistics and the shipping industry for our brands aren't aware of this. It's just how can they take advantage of it? (laughs) You want to, you know, use the regional networks that are around your distribution center. You want to take advantage of these sort of freight forwarding capabilities. You want to be able, able to provide these two to three day or expedited services to your customers, but you only have so many lanes in your, um, in your distribution center. You can only handle so many even billing capabilities and pricing capabilities. So we put all that together. We connect to uh, hundreds of alternative carriers and we pick the best route based on what you're trying to accomplish. And, And generally for what our customers are trying to accomplish is fast expedited shipping for, for, for parcels to their consumer. I love it. And by the way, we're all, cons- we might not all be experts in what you do, but we are all probably everyone listening is saying, yeah, I want fast expedited. <laughs> that's, that's what I want. I, if, if I'm a brand, I want that. But I'm, as a consumer, we're all like, yes, Mark, give me. Whoever said I want my package uh, slower, yes, right? Exactly. Really fast is what, uh, what we've been trained to expect. Right. Mark, before we hit record, we were talking about a study that you guys just did. What, first off, what was the name of your study? 
This was a study that we conducted with the University of Santa Clara, the, the Retail Management Institute there. And it was a study, um, and I'll provide you the uh, the link after the show, but it's a study that that researched, a, a, it, we interviewed over a thousand e-commerce buyers. These were, these were um, participants had, had to do at least one transaction a month. And uh, most of them did many, many more. It was across the demographic spectrum. And we asked them questions that about how important shipping and returns were in the purchase journey. And we, we had very fascinating, you know, conclusions that I think that everybody needs to, to know about. Well, give us some of them. And what I'll do is I'll put a link, I'll put a link in the show notes for it. So anyone listening can cl- click through and check out what they, you know, get to all the details, but share some of the high points of that. Well, the first finding is probably the most most obvious finding is that Amazon really drives the bus here in terms of consumer expectations in the purchase journey. So Joe, Amazon has 200 million prime customers today. That's a phenomenal number. I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so we weren't surprised to find that 75% of our, our customers in the responding uh, survey shop at Amazon and a vast majority of them had Prime or had access to a Prime account. And what Prime does is, you know, trains the customer to expect that shipping is included in their subscription, in their loyalty program, right? But also they're expected to know when the package is going to be delivered. An exact delivery estimation date is an, is an expectation of these customers. To the point where in the survey, 28% of these customers said they abandon a shopping cart if they didn't have an estimated delivery date. So the number one finding in the survey was Amazon is driving these expectations to consumers. Brands have to realize that and they have to embed Amazon-like value proposition for shipping into their purchase journey. Yep. And if I could just, this is a little bit of commentary here, but I'm sure you've uh, heard some of this. If I right now decided I wanted to go into business and I want to be an e-commerce player, I would sell on my website. But meanwhile, I don't. I can't always drive tens of thousands of people to my website immediately. That takes a little bit of time. So I might say, I, I might want to do something with Amazon. One of the challenges with that is if I say, hey, check out Joe's sweaters, right? And you, even if you've tar- typed in and said, I'm going to buy my friend Joe's sweater, and it said Joe's sweater, Amazon would say, hey, Mark, you can have Joe's sweaters. But by the way, there's like 800 other sweaters you should see first. <laughs> and that is one of the challenges. So we see certain brands, I think Nike's one of them, Allbirds. They're pulling out of Amazon because they want more control over the experience. They also don't want you seeing alternatives to their product. So Nike obviously can drive a lot of traffic to their website. They're a big company, same with Allbirds. But also Amazon doesn't necessarily, they're the same as UPS and FedEx. There's the business that works for them, but that's not everybody. If you want to store stuff in their warehouse, I got bad news for you. They don't want to help you do that. So even though they set the bar, they aren't for everybody. And that's that's um, becoming really evident to a lot of e-commerce companies. It's a, it's a scary um, proposition today. Amazon is a juggernaut in terms of, you know, and they're pretty transparent about what they're going to do. Andy Jassy comes out every year in his investor letter, and he said this, this last year that they are investing more and more in same day delivery. So they're, they're you know, they started with the two-day delivery promise. They're going to same-day delivery. Why are they doing this? Is because they see that it drives sales. This is the maybe the second big finding of our study, and this is probably the biggest thing we try to get through to people that we'd love to have working with us, is that shipping is not a cost center. It's a sales driver. 89% of, the, of our survey respondents said that estimated delivery date on the product detail page, this is early in the purchase journey, Right. I'm still deciding whether or not I'm going to click it into the cart. What do I want to know, right? I certainly want to know what color the sweater is, what size the sweater is, is it available, what price it is. But 89% said, when can I get it? Not like a range of five, seven days. They want to know the date it's going to be delivered. And, you know, like I said, 28% of them, if they didn't see that, close the page didn't do the sale. So here you've done all the work to get the customer there. You have this, you have their sweater at the right size in the warehouse, ready to go. 
And because you didn't invest in, you know, est in, in uh, estimated delivery date capability up front, you lost the customer. That's what Amazon's telling us, right? It's not because they want to put everybody out of business. It's because they're listening to the customer. Customer says, if I know I can get it faster, I'm going to click through to the next part, which is payment. So that that was our number two big finding. Yeah, that's but well, you said something that caught my attention. Logistics is a sales driver. I got to tell you, I I'm, I came from an automotive background, and we have lean in automotive, and so we were like, I kind of look at the world from order to cash, and we would always look at non value added steps. Logistics was always what you circle, and you said this is non value added. What you're telling me when, and, and by the automotive is a little different, obviously, but what you're telling me here is customers will pay extra. By the way, with my car, car parts coming into a factory, Ford won't pay you extra to get them there <laughs> in a different way, faster. They just say, here's our production schedule, be on time. What you're telling me now, though, is they want it same day. And I just heard guys from Flex, um, I forgot the founder's name now, but he was saying, he said, we're seeing tons of next day, but not a lot of same day. If what you're saying is true, and I believe it is, same day is going to drive sales for companies. Uh, certainly for Amazon, but you know, having a legitimate estimate of when you're going to get it is what the consumer is asking for. They're not necessarily saying I need it same day, but what we're giving them is like this yeah. huge range. Yeah. So I was on my favorite men's clothing provider. I won't name the name because I hope to work with them someday and, and help them through this. But, you know, I'm buying what amounted to a $90 pair of shorts, which is crazy, but, you know, they, they sell a luxury item, a $90 pair of shorts and a $70 t-shirt, right? So I have almost a $200 basket of, you know, pretty big shopping cart. I get to the product, I get to the page where it gives me my shipping options and it says free shipping, three to seven days, right? Right underneath of it, it said, you can expedite this two to three days, $30. Do you want it tomorrow? $40. So think about that, right? First of all, the difference between two to three days and three to five days, whatever they, they gave me up front, I'm a little confused about. And then charging me $30 on a $200 basket. And so clearly they're thinking about this the wrong way. They're, that $30 is a lot, a lot of profit. Even FedEx and UPS doesn't charge that much. Form. They're probably getting charged 20, 20 to $25. So there's some profit they're making in that. And a very small percentage of their customers are clicking on that. So they're using it to kind of subsidize the free part of it. And what we're saying is you don't need to do that. And our survey found that actually customers are willing to pay a little bit more to get the product in two to three days. And the number is seven to $9. So for $79, seven to $9, you could put an option there that can that can the customer will click on more than that thirty dollar option, and they'll be more satisfied, and you'll get that click through. You won't have that twenty eight percent abandonment right? And this is what we're trying to get through through folks has just look at what Amazon has done, test on your website the ability to provide this option not for thirty dollars, but for free or somewhat uh, you know somewhat free. And it will work. You'll get more customer loyalty. You'll get more more customer conversion, and you'll make more aggregate profit in the long run. Right. You know, and I'll ask this this uh, question of you. When we, I'm a Prime member, and I don't know what I pay every year, but I heard the price went up. I don't know. It comes out automatically out of something, right? So, and that's something I don't know either. We just pay it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so at some point, I go, yeah, shipping's free from Amazon. I never say once a year I pay something. Do you think, I think we'll, you pay dollars now, right? Yeah. Do, do you think we'll see more brands like the one you just talked about say, "Mark, we'll give that to you for free as if you join our loyalty program," and that loyalty program has a price? Absolutely. We found that in our in our customer response is that when they think about what loyalty means, when they think about what a loyalty program means, eighty percent of them said it has to have some shipping element, either free shipping or or sub or or cheaper expedited shipping. So when you think in the e-commerce context, loyalty means certainly the brand, how the brand makes me feel, how the products make me feel, you know, my loyalty to the service they provide. It also very much depends on the bundling of a, of a shipping program. So if a brand doesn't have a loyalty program, they probably should. 
And in that loyalty program, extremely important that they have some sort of expedited shipping option. Yep. And by the way, you know, you mentioned paying extra $30. Companies could have easily set baked some of that into the price of their goods and had free shipping and had you, you already were paying too much for your shorts and your t-shirt. If you were paying an extra 10, 12 bucks, you go, it is what it is. I like them. Right. Um, and by the way, we see that with, if you ever go to like salt and straw out in Portland or haagen if you want to buy ice cream online, I don't recommend it, but you can, <laughs> and they will just add to the price of the goods and say free shipping. And, but by the way, your little ice cream pint cost 12 bucks, right? They had to double the price of that to give you free shipping. But that's kind of what we've seen in the past with certain parts of our business. Well, you know, it's so to move beyond just the concept of free shipping to get into uh, the results of our study, it was actually the not just the speed, but the accuracy and the proactive communication that went with it. Imagine getting ice cream. You definitely want to know when that ice cream's going to arrive, right? You'd want to track that every step of the way. So the other part we found is that while the speed was important, 64% said delivery, next to delivery cost, the, the cost and the transparency was equally important. So when was it going to get there? What was it going to cost? And how how accurate will the, will the delivery date be? So investing in those elements of it and and working with a provider that allows you to not go into a black box and say, you know, it's, it's, it's coming. A lot of customers want sort of kind of turn by turn updates on when their, their product's going to get there. Some of them don't, some of them don't want to know every, but for a highly considered purchase, you want to know when did it go out for shipping? Is it on track? What stage is it in? And when can I expect it at my doorstep? So that that became a very very important part of the the, the findings that we uh, that we got from the study. Yep, I will say I'm one of those people who when I buy online, I bought early online where my sweater would take one week, and I thought, isn't it a miracle that we can get something shipped from somewhere to my house in a week? Woo! Yeah, but I, so you, I could say I don't care, but I do notice this now. I live in Michigan. We do have weather here, and. Also, if I'm out and about and I know I'm getting clothes put on the porch, I don't want the porch pirates to get my stuff. So I do want to know when it's going to get there. So if I'm going to leave the house and I go, well, wait a sec, it says this is going to deliver in the next half hour, I'll hang out. So even me, when I say I don't care, and I might, if I was to take your survey, I might have said, I don't care, but I care enough about certain things. If it was in electronics, I thought it's expensive. Okay, I'm I'm gonna care. I might not care about a sweater, but also if it's raining or snowing and we do have that here, I don't want my stuff getting wet. This this turned out to be a, another interesting thing we found is that, you know, especially with COVID, we we leaned on services for food delivery like Instacart oh, yeah. and DoorDash. Like and think about what they've done to kind of revolutionize this concept of transparency of delivery. Like when a pizza gets to your door, you want to be there to get it, right? It's got to be hot. And so they have turn by turn. You know who the driver's, you know, the driver's name. You can see them coming down the street on the app. You know what car they're driving. That is going into parcel delivery. So whereas this anonymous kind of package used to just get thrown on our doorstep, now you have tracking that allows you to know when it's coming, who's bringing it, and you'll get a photo verification of where the parcel is when you, when you, when you get it, right? which means you could be at the office and, and making sure this happens and you can tell somebody to go pick up the package or you can communicate with the, with the, uh, the courier and say, you know, I'm not going to be there. Can you reroute it to your run tomorrow? Th that type of interaction, not for, again, not for all of our packages, but are coming more and more accepted. We're actually working with, with DoorDash today using their dashers to deliver parcels. So while they're crisscrossing your town, picking up, you know, lunch, they're also dropping off parcels at the uh, at, at these various addresses with the same technology and the same transparency that they do for food. They've brought that to the parcel delivery. Oh, I love it! I love that because one of the things we struggle with is when you talk about like a DoorDash guy. They, they do we, they are optimizing those routes, but let's just say you're in an area that doesn't have density of shipments. So it's nice that they you can say we're going to we're going to maximize not only the uh you can pay that guy more potentially for doing that delivery but also 
I don't have the environmental impact of two, two drivers. I have one driver and, um, also we're, we're also going to struggle. I'm, I'm one of the younger baby boomers. When I leave, when people my age leave, there's 400,000 fewer people in the generation right behind us. So who's going to do DoorDash? I always say, who's going to work in the factories? Who's going to work in the warehouses? Who's going to deliver this stuff? Well, it's going to have to be well paid. <laughs> I know those four daughters of yours probably grew up expecting <laughs> a good income. <laughs> Don't get me started on my daughter's expectations for, for delivery of clothing. But yeah, I'd say this is one of the more fascinating, fast moving parts and most expensive part of the parcel delivery chain is the final mile. Because you're right, you need that density. So you have laser ship and they combine with on track and they're creating this super regional delivery capability. You have LSO, you have these, and then you have a, a myriad of regionals, but I can tell you firsthand knowledge and it's public, DoorDash, Uber, Walmart are all getting into this game because they have that density. They're already doing these types of deliveries. So combining these and getting density of delivery for their final mile carrier, be they, you know, the, the gig economy driver or, 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 or a robot eventually one day is where this, some of this will go. There's a lot of disruption happening there. And I think it's going to drive down the cost and increase the, tra- the service transparency for consumers. Yep. And I do know, maybe you can touch on this for a second. We see a lot of players in the small parcel space are using the postal service, USPS, United States Postal Service for that final mile. And the reason is because it is the final mile that they've always done. That's the expensive piece. Yeah, that's kind of what the postal service kind of ultimately will continue to be is that last mile, especially on the on the tougher zip codes to deliver to. We use them as well because they are covering they do have that density for the for the first class mail so um they're they're useful to us in about maybe seven percent of our deliveries where we don't have a uh, a regional final mile delivery carrier but they're they're quickly getting you know competed out for that so right it's pretty <laughs> right and by the way this is this is, i don't want to drag you too much off on my tangent but that post post uh you put your post box on your house that is against the law for somebody to put stuff in there other than the postal service. Am I right to say that? I think you're definitely right. But you know what? I live up here in Incline Village in Nevada. I don't have one. <laughs> right, right. I don't. A lot of my custom, a lot of my neighbors don't because it's just it's not useful anymore. Right to have that. All you'd get is junk mail in it anyway. Yeah. So all of the packages go to a third party. You know, it's called Postal Express. And so there's a lot of infrastructure that's being built that enable Marg- us to do what we do. All we're doing is tapping into that infrastructure, be it for you know deliveries or returns or, or first mile or mid mile. Yep. So I want to take a quick time out to tell you about my friends over at Lean Solutions Group. Lean Solutions is a nearshore offshore service provider, and they provide a range of services, including operation, technology, marketing, sales, and business process outsourcing. They work with over 500 U.S. transportation and logistics companies. And what they have is this model where they have satellite offices down in Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, and the Philippines. And their their approach is real, low cost, low risk, low hassle. They have 9,000 employees now. They're one of the fastest growing companies in America. And again, everybody I know seems to be working with them. But if you're not working with them, check them out. Lean Group, L-E-A-N Group.com. And by the way, my podcast is edited by someone from Lean, Lean Solutions Group. They're a fantastic company. I just did an interview with Ryan Mann. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Check them out. So why are companies coming to you? Are they saving money or are they seeing better service? Um, what's, what's the reason they go to Margo? Yes and yes. <laughs> so at the top end, like we work with companies like Saks, you know, they're using oh, wow. us for, yeah, I yeah, know we're very proud to have them. You know, they're shipping very high value items, right? Where service is an expectation of the brand. So, so absolutely all the things we found in our study, Saks knows, you know, you're buying an $800 pair of boots or a $200 handbag. You want to get it. You want to know where it is. You want to get it as quickly as you can. So they trust us to do that. We can operate in a two to three day 
uh, promise for them. And they're using us really for carrier diversification. They're big enough. They're using FedEx. They're using UPS. They're, they're probably using a couple other regional carriers, but they don't want to single thread it through one. They're, one of the things we talked about before the podcast is that's how expensive FedEx and UPS is getting and how kind of they cherry pick. So they don't want to be without capacity. So they add us as a capacity driver and they're adding us increasingly for that two to three day delivery capability we have. For other brands that we use, smaller brands like Buck Mason or, or Chubby's, these are, these are you know, digital first, direct to consumer brands. They're using us primarily as their, 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 their primary carrier because we're able to work out of a single distribution center and provide them this two to three day delivery footprint. So they don't have to triplicate their inventory to add all that cost and complexity. They can reach the East Coast, West Coast, and the mid-country using Margo without spending a fortune to expedite that, that delivery. I love it. I love so it's it. lower cost, higher, higher, higher service level. Yeah, I saw this with, uh, and I won't mention the names because I'm going to disparage them, but two high-end men's clothing companies disappointed me. One was a gift from my kid, and they sent... This was uh, during COVID, so there's a little bit of wiggle room here. But my Christmas gift that they sent in early December arrived in mid-January. The second gift, which was just a duplicate of the first gift, arrived late January, and I had to go. I had to return it to the store. And I remember thinking, this brand is known for its service, and that's in their retail locations. But I expected that. Now that I was getting something sent to my home, that reputation would extend to a home delivery, and it did not. And that's the risk these companies take, is they build these, if you're a, a mortar first brand that's been around forever, and you say, my customers are willing to pay extra because they know they get this phenomenal service and quality, and then it falls down on the home delivery and go, maybe I'll look around and see who else is out there. We'll get this in our survey, Joe, 57% said that they had stopped using a brand because of a bad uh, delivery experience. 57%. Now, keep in mind, our survey is is with the top of the top. These are people making at least one purchase a month, most of them many, many more. So if you lose that customer, the lifetime value of that customer is huge because it's huge. And so... This mentality of you exactly said brick and mortar, the product's there, the customer comes in, they pick it up. You didn't have to think this way. When you're do, going direct to consumer in the digital age, the shipping experience is part of the brand. And you've got to you've got to learn these lessons early. And we just we just see we did a we did a review of the hundred top shippers uh, shipping brands in the in the US. And there's they're just rife with inconsistencies and they're not following these lessons. So there's a big gap here and FedEx and UPS isn't helping them figure it out. It's actually making it worse. They're telling them either, either slow the product down and put it on the ground and tell them we'll get there in five to seven days or charge a fortune. And we just don't think that's a, that's a, a good option. And it's certainly not the option your biggest competitor, Amazon, is taking. So these are really, really critical lessons that, that uh, brands have to learn. Oh, yeah. There's, there's no, no doubt. Uh, again, the bar just gets higher and higher, and I can't envision it going any different. I don't think Amazon's going to let up. But also, as we start to see, you mentioned Walmart getting into home delivery more. I think they'll figure it out at some point and be very, very good at it. And so these, if you're a brand, you don't have a, cho- you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice, but I also say it's doable. You know, you can leverage a company like ours who has done the work to, to, to do the hard work to normalize, you know, trucks picking up your distribution center, airplanes taking off at the nearest airport, landing at the closest airport to your customer, and gig economy drivers or regional carriers taking it. It's, it, it works 24-7 <laughs> at a 99.9% success rate. So the hope here is that through, you know, services like you, you know, podcasts like you folks out there listening, it it looks like just complexity and and cost. And really what you need to think about it is, is a, is a driver of conversion rate, a closer of sales and, and a, a lock on the loyal customer that you have to have in this day and age. Yep. And I think, I think if you were to ask the vast majority of people out there who ship small parcel, they would say there aren't alternatives, but there are now alternatives like yours, like Margo. So Final thoughts on your study. Then I want to talk about who's your sweet spot. Final thoughts on your study. And I'll put a link to your study in the show notes. 
I'd say the big conclusions coming out of the study uh, that if I were a VP of logistics at a, at a brand, you know, charged with uh, e-commerce, I'd say they need to invest in this estimated delivery date capability and they need to move it up to the product detail page of the e-commerce site. That's a minimum today. And that's going to involve, guess what? The marketers and the logistics folks need to get together on this. And that's not always the case. There's a lot of organizational siloing that happens that, you know, that's not my job. It's 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 your job, not my cost center. It's got to be front and center on the product delivery page. That's number one. I would say stop treating shipping as a, as a profit center. That example I showed, the $30 two to three day and test the impact of offering faster and and more standard free or slightly you know uh, more reasonably cost expedited shipping. I think what they'll find is they're going to get that conversion rate benefit and it's going to be the most meaningful customer segment that they're missing. I'd say if you don't have a loyalty program, you probably should have some form of loyalty program to to get those your most loyal customers kind of locked in and shipping expedited shipping needs to be a component. I think those are the really the three top things that I would take away from the study that we had. Yep. If I could add something to that loyalty program, I have people on my podcast not so long ago talking about the prepared meals where you get the prepared meals shipped. And they say the acquisition cost for a customer who's willing to do these meal plans when you ship every week, it says very high to get a customer. And they said, and you don't make enough money with the one off. So you have to keep those. So the the challenge with a lot of those meal plans is you paid a lot to get that customer and a lot of them will drop off after one or two. And if all you have to do is disappoint them once and they're out. But what if you can get to that place where you have their loyalty and you say that is a lifetime value customer as opposed to the customer that you basically lost them early. And I think we're going to have to look the same way in some of these e-commerce brands. They're a different business, but it's close enough. We're a customer of those in our house. And I'll tell you, it's a shipping product, right? Because the food's a bit of a commodity, right? I can get the hamburger and the onions and the, the things that come in the, the box. I can get them right up the street. Why do I get them? Because it comes to me at the time that I wanted in the shape that I expect it. So those products are shipping products. And, and really now it's true for everything. Sweaters, socks, <laughs> shoes, and, uh, and and that and that's really uh, the challenge I think for 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 major brands today, small, medium, and large. Yep. So who's the sweet spot for you and Margot? Today, it's a you know we're a U.S. focused company. We do some work in Canada, but pr- predominantly U.S. And you want to be shipping at least 500 packages a day. So that's going to put you at the kind of higher end of the e-com spectrum for us. You know, 500 packages a day, generally in the one to 20 pound category is where we do a really, really great job. Are these traditionally retail companies that are getting into e-commerce? Are these kind of the digital natives? It's interesting. It's both. I mean, what I've seen over the last really 10 years, I guess, in my career is that the large brands have have learned the lesson and spun their e-com divisions into a, a separate unit. Saks, you know, actually spun the whole business out into its own unit, separate from the brick and mortar stores. But Generally, we work with the e-com divisions of the larger groups or, you know, like you mentioned, Allbirds, we work with them, these these digitally native brands that start with one distribution center and then grow hyperbolic, you know, when they, they get the marketing formula figured out. They're a great client of ours uh, because we can, we can allow them to extend that growth out of that one distribution center, which is a phenomenal, we talked about venture capital and return on capital, not having to expand into multiple distribution centers in order to meet a two to three SLA is a is a huge win for our clients. So what about a lot of people on my listen to my podcast are warehousing and fulfillment people. Do you work with those companies also? Yeah, we do. So 3PLs are, are a, a, a big partner of ours. Rider Whiplash is, uh, oh, yeah. is, is a big, yeah, they do. They do a great job uh, for e-commerce companies. And we are a, uh, we're one of their primary carriers in the Rider Whiplash kind of carrier network. I interviewed Gary Allen at Manifest. We'll talk about Manifest in a minute because I know we'll see you guys there next year. But I interviewed Gary Allen, the VP of, I think, Warehousing Innovation over there. And I was shocked at how many e-commerce warehousing locations Ryder has. And I'm here in uh, Michigan. Ryder and Penske seem to have all of the automotive business. So I know that was half of their business for a long time. So the idea that they've they've experienced 
just they continue to grow. And I think automotive is less than 50% of their business now. They're still fantastic at it, but Ryder does e-commerce and a lot of it. <laughs> a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. They, they're, they're, they're huge. I mean, I think there's like 20 or so that I know of myself in the whiplash network. And so you'd ask, well, why do they need, you know, why do they need us? They've got so many warehouses. Can't, aren't they? It's, it's because the challenge of having the right product and the right warehouse at the right time is a huge, massive challenge. And so we augment their carrier networks by able to provide this two to three day SLA, regardless of where the product is. So it's a real benefit that they provide to their customers by working with Margo. Yep. Mark, what I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, a link to your website, a link to that study that we talked about, and any of the links you and your marketing team give me. I'll put all those in the show notes. And I want to ask you, before we wrap this bad boy up, I like to interview smart, interesting people like you who are killing it in the space. Who else should I interview? Well, I'm on the board of a, of, a, of a logistics company that I think a lot of people never heard of called Armada out of, out of Pittsburgh. They do cold chain logistics orchestration for some of the largest fast food and, and uh, restaurants in the world. I never heard of them. <laughs> Fascinating company. And John Burke's a great guy. He's the CEO. I bet he'd love to talk to you, Joe. I would love it. I would love it. Maybe if you've got his email, you CEOs are hard to get their, e- their email sometimes. I know why. <laughs> so what conferences will we see you at? Well, the, the major ones we go to are Manifest, which we just have. I'll phenomenal, see you there, yeah. Phenomenal one in Vegas that I, that I attended. And we go to a, a shop, shop Talk, which I, I believe just happened as well. I did not attend that one myself. We get a lot of the regional ones as well, but we'll provide you a list of the ones we're going to be at in the, uh, in the show notes. Excellent, excellent. Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking the time. I love what you guys are doing. I think it's so long overdue that we start having alternatives to the big two. Nothing against those guys, but we all need competition to keep us keep us honest. <laughs> That's right. We want to make sure you get your menswear on time without any disappointment. That's exactly. What we're here exactly. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Mark. It's a lot of fun, Joe. Thanks. Yep. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.